Welcome back to our second part about patents in our series about copyright and licenses. In this episode, we continue our discussions with uh, Mirko. So, so please check out our previous episode for some background to, to patents. And let's dive right back into the discussions. So, so how do you go about this as a developer? I mean, it, it sounds almost like something you should be worried about. But, but hopefully you're small enough fish to, to, to not have to do that. But what, what can you do as a developer? What, what? I think it's difficult to say what can you do as a developer. We need to uh, separate scenarios, right? First of all, uh, as we just discussed, the problem does not go away by ignoring it or not looking at it, right? So um, if you distribute technology and it includes patented functionality, you are in trouble if you don't have a license. Now, uh, if you're an individual software developer participating in an upstream project and, and co contributing patches to it, um, it's very unlikely that that this causes a problem for two reasons. One, the community usually doesn't have financial income, so it's difficult to coerce anybody to pay for, uh, for a patent license. But the second thing is that um, the actual product that is brought into the market is typically only fixed, if you will, once the hardware and the software is combined. So if I'm a mobile phone manufacturer and I make devices and I integrate software into it, then I'm the person creating a physical product and I am selling it in the market and then people will come after me. Uh, so the, the situation is really different depending on are you an industry, industrial company that produces, say, phones, or are you a small software community that distributes code under an open source license? Um, yeah, so first of all, problem doesn't go away if um, if you don't look at it. Um, the classical licenses like MIT and BSD, they're very simple, right? But they don't give you clarity. So my recommendation in this regard is always to go with uh, licenses that have an explicit patent license, patent grant, or patent clause. Um, but, which, because this basically means that you are clearly saying how you want patents to be licensed with uh, along with your code. Um, they're also usually more modern and more coherent. Um, and, and easier to to follow and to enforce. So, but I have a question. So, as a community, you might be uh, distributing code, but you might also uh, have like a service which you provide, which is not a physical thing, but perhaps on the online, like a forum or whatever. And it might have some button presses which someone has uh, patents for or something like that. Does it? It com does do I need to think about those things also, or is it mostly just hardware related? Well, it's about products that uh, are intended to generate revenue. That's where you have to be more diligent, more careful, right? So if you're running a service and you ask people to pay a membership fee, you're more of a target for somebody who wants to enforce a patent than a community just distributing a piece of software that's used everywhere. So usually we don't see litigation against the communities. But quite recently, we have seen a case against the GNOME Foundation that was then in the end settled with a proper defense by the open source community. Um, but this happens, So, but it's not very common. Um, most of the, the kind of typical scare scenarios, like the one click thing that was patented, um, they're not that relevant anymore. Um, the, the patents are um, expired part of them and also the industry has moved on and I think focuses more on actual like, tangible functionality um, before there's actual litigation but I don't think the problem has gone away so as a community I would definitely make sure that I have a rough understanding at least of what I'm running and usually you can assume that um, software for example like a web server or forum um, that that's not like patented functionality okay but, but let's say that I'm, I'm I'm still a bit afraid of of patents. So, is there a way that I can be like protected? Can I join a, a league of uh, of patent holders to cover myself? Yeah. So there's one entity, one organization in the uh, free software ecosystem. That's the Open Invention Network. And it, as a disclaimer, I um, worked with the Open Invention Network for many years to um, define the scope of their cross licensing agreement. Um, and the idea here is that um, many organizations and communities can join together and they all enter into a cross license where they say, if I hold a patent, um, I give a license 
to for the for the use on like basic uh, open source technologies uh, of these patents. And this is quite a large community, has over three thousand member organizations, including very large patent holders like Google and IBM and NEC. So uh, that gives you some peace of mind that many open source communities have become um, members in this network. Um, but it's still similar to what, that's what was said earlier. Uh, it, it still only gives you peace of mind with regard to those people that participate in such a network, and and those who um, mm. like in a millennial way try to abuse the system, they are usually not. But um, I would say in general, it's quite exceptional that we see uh, litigation against, say, uh, free software communities or individual contributors. Large companies they fire tooth and nail, but that's you know that's what they do. Is it mostly because you? cannot uh, get money from from individuals and communities because they don't have money or what's why is it? i think they th this goes a bit into um like philosophical details on the patent system but um the the idea that i laid out earlier of the brilliant inventor that acquires a patent and then if, if that person's lucky gets rich um mm. i i think that's really more of an uh, idealistic picture uh, in reality mm. patent portfolios are well, weapons and trade wars in the end. I mean, yes. um, uh, which you can um, understand if you look at how people are arguing, because they're not arguing about specific patent claims. They're arguing that I hold 2,000 patents and you, two, you hold 2,500 patents, and therefore I am more innovative than you, or the other <laughs> way around. Um, okay. So with that in, in mind, I think like actual like large-scale patent litigation, that's a game for very big companies. Um, sometimes it's a game to suppress innovative young startups. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's a game for international uh, trade policy. Um, and I think we're just, first of all, we're working in an environment where um, cross-licensing and, and free licensing is the norm. Um, and, and second, there's also no money to be made in, in like trying to go after the Apache community. Mm, okay. You mentioned that uh, it's for trade wars, so I would imagine it's between different countries and so on. And you mentioned also that it's like uh, that it works worldwide. I mean, laws are national, not international. Aren't that's they? a that's a very good point, and I say this said, said this a bit sloppily, right? Um, I, I mainly wanted to point out that communities are usually not like they're, they're too small a fish in the in the pond to be uh, affected by this. But an interesting point that you mentioned is um, patent law is national. Uh, you usually acquire a patent for um, your country or countries that you are selling products in. And for example, in the European Union, you can get a European patent office patent grant, and then um, to, that's usually valid for like, across the European patent community. Um, but the, the way patents work is pretty international because there's an organization called the World Intellectual Property Organization, which is a part of the United Nations. And that organization standardizes not just patenting, but also the copyright um, regulation. Um, so every member company, uh, member country, sorry, that is um, a part of uh, WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, has th their legal system has to fulfill certain standards. And so, for example, the, the minimum um, extent in years of copyright protection or the way patents are granted is very much standardized all over the world. And I want to mention that it's a, it's a myth that um, there are some countries, like large industrial countries, that kind of ignore the patent system and steal from everybody. That's, um, that, that myth, for some reason, holds uh, and comes up again and again. But... Um, the countries you mentioned, they wouldn't be trading with each other at very large scale if they wouldn't respect each other's property systems very well, right? So things have developed a lot in that uh, patent protection pretty much works the same way all over the, um, the developed world. Mm -hmm. So globalization basically helped patents to be global also. Uh, yeah, I mean, typically a lot of these, a lot of changes like that are driven by trade, right? If you want to mm. trade goods, um, you want free trade agreements, you want property protection that's similar in the markets that you sell. And uh, these are interests that are usually well represented in policy making. So, yeah. Okay, okay. Interesting. Okay. But 
you're saying it's it's pretty much standardized with the with the patents. What what differences are there between different countries or different styles of law and so on? There are, there are differences. Um, I think the differences are less in, in how patents basically work. The, the process, for example, that I have a, explained of how you invent something and then you file for a patent application and it's granted. I think that's pretty standard. And the the duration of how long a patent uh, lasts, for example, is also pretty much standard. I think it's at least 10 years and it can be extended to 20. Um, what is different, for example, is um, are the requirements for um, inventiveness or inventive step. Um, where, for example, the European Patent Office is more strict than others. Um, then there are some exclusions for what can be patented. So, for example, um, we have this provision that software as such is not patentable. However, like when we say we, Europe, the European Patent Office, however, computer implemented inventions can be patentable. And so you have to prove that your invention is not just software, it has an actual technical effect. Um, requirements for yeah, how inventive it is that you're presenting may, di may be different. And uh, in Europe, we have um, a tradition of requiring like a demonstratable inventive step. So the patents actually have to be novel. Um, are, are, you yeah. are you saying that in other countries, patents don't need to be novel? That sounds uh, It's not a question of, of yes or no. It's more a question of the level. Right. So, for example, and this changes over time too. So, it's, it's very difficult to make generalized statements here. So, for example, um, there was a time when you could easily get a patent for doing something that was done by machines in a computer. It was considered an invention that this could also be done by computers. Uh -huh. Then um, technology continued to develop, and you had an, an understanding develops that people say, actually, that's not a new invention. And then the court will say, so we're so we rejecting this patent. It's not valid because it's something that has been done before in the physical world on the computer. Okay. Um, and, and, and this is local, like national legislation and, uh, and, and jurisdiction. That means that the standards then change over time. But this is a very difficult subject because it really um, kind of reflects the technical development and the, the um, interaction between uh, legislation and jurisdiction in the different countries. So something that pops out to me when, when talking internationally is that it fe it feels very dispute driven, very common law, so to speak. It, it's not like a central agency monitors the patent. Somebody has to go after you explicitly. Mm -hmm. um, it, does that have a historical background or something like that, or, or how how come it ended up in that way? Do you know that? Um, I think this is because of how patents work. Um, because uh, when we say you need a patent license, the assumption is that you have a, an agreement, which is typically a contract where somebody holds a patent. And that agreement says, whatever, if you're building washing machines, every time you sell a washing machine, I will get this many euros from you um, for my invention that's embodied in a washing machine. If you have a contract and you stick to the contract and you fulfill it, then it's just normal a balance of payment that has to be exchanged. The problem is um, that if you, for example, don't even try to get a license and you just assume that that invention is not valid to you, then you're incompliant, but you never talk to the, actual, the person actually holding the patent. And so then you're in a different legal environment where the state will come and enforce that against you. You never, you never spoke to that person. That's why we speak of compliance. Compliance is something that where you have to like fulfill the requirements of the law. Um, and because then uh, two parties that never uh, like negotiated before the product was introduced into the market are now in a dispute. That's why a lot of these discussions end up in court and being decided in court. Because uh, as the actual, uh, as the patent holder, that's the way that you interact with the other person. Right? You try to ask them for a patent license for like a patent fee, and they say no. And then the only thing you can do is go to court. Um, this is an, this is a general issue with. Um, uh, like these uh, rights to knowledge or intellectual property, right? It's, it's that you, it's a, it's a right to exclude others from using something. And these others, they don't necessarily even need to know you, right? And so a lot of this ends up being litigated. So one, one aspect, we, we talked about modern licenses and so on. And when, when talking about modern GNU licenses, for instance, we, we imply GPL v3 and so on. Um, uh, one of the the largest or most known projects 
using the GPL, the Linux kernel sits with GPL v2. Um, how come they get away with that? I think there are two reasons. Um, one is uh, what we call the GPL firewall, right? So that um, the, the assumption that an application that's running as a process on Linux is not a derivative work of the kernel. Because otherwise, every application would have to be GPL, right? Um, so we have this assumption that uh, just because the application, the process talks to the kernel using um, system calls, that is just a protocol that they speak, and the application is still licensed independently from the kernel. Otherwise, everything would have to be GPL, right? That runs on Linux. Um, the other one is that around Linux, a very strong community has developed where many of the major patent holders are active contributors to Linux. Um, so there's a general interest in protecting Linux from patent litigation. And there's also a strong interest in, in acting as a, like a good citizen in the community. Um, and the, the Open Invention Network that I mentioned earlier was actually founded originally to protect Linux primarily at the operating system itself. Um, and so in the industry, I think a, an understanding has developed that basically says where we collaborate, we don't uh, litigate, right? So we work together on the kernel and um, we assume that what we create there together, that's uh, kind of uh, like under joint stewardship and we will not litigate against other participants. Um, but also Linux is, of course, a product that as such is not very useful, right? You have to put it on a computer and run it. And so the litigation in the end ends up being about something on a phone or a server computer and not about the operating system itself. Uh, this relates a bit, or your answer does, to a question I have written down here. It's the, do you see any new trends in the views on, on, on patterns in the uh, software community and in the free and open source software community? That's an interesting question. It really def uh, depends on your perspective on what's new. <laughs> um, so we have. <laughs> I'm old, so everything is new. Yeah. So we have something called the software patent debate, right? And um, there's kind of a traditional standoff between. Well, there's, there's something called a patent community, right? A, a community of proponents of the patent system. And they usually come from industries where the patent system has served them quite well. Um, for example, machining, um, pharmaceuticals, etc. And on the other side, you find um, like the, the open source ecosystem represented by people that are used to sharing their knowledge, etc. And um, this is a standoff that has been basically been going on ever since... Uh, free software is a thing and has a strong community. It culminated in a way, I think in 2005, when the European Parliament decided that we shouldn't have software patents in Europe. Um, however, that wasn't really de divisive, decisive in a way that uh, it actually ruled it out because the European Patent Office is an independent ent entity and um, has its own understanding of computer implemented inventions. So. Um, I think this attitude hasn't changed very much in the last 20 years. The um, open source community is not a proponent, proponent of patents and rather would not like to see them apply to software. And um, many industry players see this differently. Um, and I don't, at the political level, I don't currently see um, that le legislative change is on the horizon. Um, I think that um, there's basically, the standoff is quite still. Everybody's pointing at the others and saying they're doing it wrong. Um, but if you look at how the patent system works, that means even if there would be a change tomorrow or next year, we would still have the problem with patents as they stand for another 20 years because there's existing patents out there that are valid for that long. So um, I think that problem is not going away and the open source ecosystem is well advised to, to manage it properly, I think. It, it feels like we, we have a lot of detailed questions to follow up about. Uh, but I, at the same time, we're, we're, we've spent quite a bit of time on this. So uh, I'd like to thank you for your participation this time. And I hope we will hear you in a future episode. My pleasure. And I'm very interested in doing so. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>